Um, so I'm Amy, for those who don't know me, I, I see a bunch of friends in here and, and all happy times. So um, feel free to heckle, feel free to you know, make me tell other stories. Um, but typically, I do talks about project management. And last year I was like, I am not doing project management as much as I was doing before, and I don't want to give project management talks, and that's boring, and this is awful in time. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be like that. You all locked in with me. Great. Um, so I really came with the, the position that like, no, I'm not giving project management talks. I am not really working in project management. I'm more in like a kind of weird onboarding, customer solutions, technical thing. So, you know, no project management talks. That's not true. This actually turned into more of a project management talk because you can't give a talk without being you and I am a project manager and it's like that. Yeah. So. But these are all the ways to be able to find me. Um, obligatory hiring announcement. We are, we are definitely hiring. Come, come play with me. If you want to come play with me and all of my brethren, it'll be a great time. Um, and, you know, again, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to be able to, you know, stop me, make me move along as we go. So I was thinking about this out of a series of frustrating interactions where I didn't really have a good handle on all of the dynamics that were going on in meetings and long, long, frustrating conversations through just trying to figure out, okay, open source, what are we doing? It's, it's open source. We really have no idea of what we're doing. And um, running with scissors was kind of funny. But at the same time, we are actually a remarkably successful group of people in terms of the way that open source is working. We have gotten so much done in, like, I mean, OSCON recently celebrated 10 years. I think it was 10. I'm looking around in the room to be able to like, you know, 10? Yeah, 10 years of OSCON. No, they, I know that they've done like, you know, like the, they've, last year they talked about like they had moved from the, this dynamic sort of amazing thing to this default. So open source is in many ways taken over the world. Um, so it's worth being able to see, okay, how do we all work together? What's, what makes this particular thing work? So I started thinking about teams. And teams being everyone sort of aligned towards one goal. Um, in the keynote, James talked about how we, we are actually moving towards many different goals, and we don't all know what they all are at the same time. Um, and I'm really interested to see where all of that goes. But for the purposes of this, we'll start with, we're, we're moving towards one goal. But that team also involves you. And as I said before, I wasn't going to be giving project management talks, but I am because that's who I am. And wherever you go, there you are. Um, and this is actually kind of a follow-up from the uh, kicking off imposter syndrome, because imposter syndrome is also not knowing who you are, not knowing who you're being in that particular area and that particular interaction and that relationship, all of these things. Wherever you go, there you are. But this is the last time it's about you. This is it. Four minutes in. Four minutes in, and this is the last time it's about you. I was looking for duck lips in this, but I don't think I actually succeeded because a selfie is just so much of everything that's about you. It's just about you. Like, you are awesome. You bring many, many, many things to the table. You have lots of different skills, and the things that are easy for you are hard for someone else. Watch for this in some of the conversations that you're going to have over this week. Someone is going to say something to you that is going to go, seriously? Like, that's tough. Like, but I get that. Like, what? Understand that the things that are easy for them are going to be hard for you. It's kind of where this is working from. But moving on to more relationships, I started off with, okay, most uncomplicated relationship that maybe you can have, you and your dog. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, uh, this can also be like cat reactions in terms of, okay, look, all I am doing is interacting with something else that is not a person. Not saying anything about dogs, not saying anything about like they might not be people or like dogs don't have souls, not going there, not talking about the dog that doesn't have a soul. No, this is more about you are working with something else that doesn't have the same ways of being able to interact with you. This can also be the same for being able to work with your development environments, the ways that you interact with um, your MacBook. Shiny hiding over here. But this is an uncomplicated relationship, mostly. Kind of breaking it down towards, there's stuff that you can know about you, 
there's definitely the ways that your relationship with your dog and your tools and all of that, and I smack my mic, these things also tell you more about who you are. So knowing who you are in these interactions, a way to be able to start. You and your co-pilot. You're going to know who your co-pilot is. This can mean many, many different things in your life, and this can mean many different things in your relationships, but you know who your co-pilot is. This is the person that you're working the most closely to. This is the person that you're going to have long interactions with over a long period of time. Um, this is not the same thing as like a romantic relationship. Um, that's specifically out. But the dynamic between your co-pilot that you're working with most directly, where you're both aligned in terms of this is your team, this is who we are going with directly, this person. But your favorite person can also be your co-pilot. There can be somebody else involved. These relationships are the ones that sustain you. These are your friends. These are the people that are going to be able to work with you, to be able to make sure that, hey, look, we're all aligned in the same sort of way, and also we're really happy. These relationships are important, and understanding who you are in these relationships matters as well. Again, they might all be the same things. Sort of working down the stack here. You and your coworkers. So I added this slide yesterday because I was a little freaked out about this talk. I'm not going to lie. Um, again, I normally give talks about project management. This is not a project management talk. What am I doing here? How am I being in this talk? I don't know what I'm doing. OK. So my poor coworkers, I was not that much fun to be around yesterday because I was stressed out. I was unhappy. This was not cool. So I put up a slide of this is what our office looks like when we first moved in. It sort of looks like this now, except that there are other people around here. But I'm here, right up here in between all of these other people, and I interact with my coworkers every day, and they have to inter interact with them. Hello, <laughs> welcome. I'm also here now. <laughs> and, and it's a pleasure to see you. So the ways that I interact with my coworkers will change as well, depending on where I am in my environment, depending on where I am thinking about what's going on. Um, person over here was definitely noticing me being very freaked out about many things, and the interaction that I had with him that day was a little different than what our normal interactions are. Something had changed in the tone. But until I realized that I was the one freaking out, that was all on me, no good was going to happen that day because I, I was twitchy and nervous. And, and I gave him what I thought was a really important piece of information. And, and the reaction that I got back made me feel like I was pressuring him or I was somehow, like, something was going on. So I just kind of shut down and like kind of curled up back in my corner. I didn't say anything for the rest of the day. And then at the end of the day, I realized that I had actually completely misinterpreted all of that interaction. There was nothing about that that was, he was he, like, he had actually taken that vital piece of information and said, you're right, that is a vital piece of information. But I, I, I just heard it as, oh God, oh God, like he, I'm, I'm pressuring him something bad. It was wrong, it was all wrong, and that was all on me. It wasn't anything about him. It was all on me. So I tell you that story because you and your coworkers, you're going to see them a lot. And knowing who you're being with your coworkers is another way to be able to think about all of these layers of dynamics that we go through. There's also your manager. And your manager is going to be, typically, most of the managers that I've worked with, they have had rough jobs. Um, because, I mean, one, they're trying to manage me, which is awesome. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But typically, your manager is going to be dealing with things that you are not going to be dealing with. They have things they answer to higher up, and they're trying to make things happen underneath you. So I have another talk about making your manager's job easier. Look for that one in July, and I've also given that talk in other ways. But typically, your manager is going to have more to do than you can possibly imagine. So this is another relationship of how do I interact with them to make their job easier? What is my goal in terms of working with them? And I just thought this slide was so perfect for that because they're usually buried under things that you have no idea. How do I make that work? How do I you know, manage up, as we say in the business terms? But really, how do I make their lives easier? You're all going to have managers remembering this and that the dynamic is different between your coworkers and your managers and how that all changes as well. So everyone's following story time? Do we, what do we want more of? No? OK, story time. We'll continue on story time. I'm also trying to think about this as working in an open source company because there's lots of different things that we can work within. Um, and then there's lots of different development shops as well and ways that you're going to work with. So 
I, 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 again, I was trying not to make this project management talk, but I'm a project manager. And so when my designer comes up to me, it's like having Jack Sparrow come up and say things to me like, what? But you're, you're saying things like, I, I don't know what you're saying. I, uh, I speak the language of developer. I, I, I mostly know what they're saying. At the same time, your designer is going to have something really valuable to bring to the table. Um, I was thinking about this from my experience working in development shops as your designer is going to be the one that's going to be talking about look and feel, and they're going to be talking about emotional things. And yeah, sometimes they're just going to stare at you when you say something really dumb. It means that you are not connecting with where they're coming from, that the relationship isn't aligned in a way that's going to be like, oh, right, we actually are on the same team. Again, as the project manager, I have to think about how I can interact with them in a way that's going to be meaningful. But then you ante up, and you have a design team. And there's the guy that's just telling you no to everything up on top. And he just hates everything. And he's talking about fonts and kerning. And he's talking about layouts and wireframes. You're like, what just happened? Huh? And, you're, and everybody else is going to have opinions. And then you're going to have the person up on top, like the, the person with the room tours, that like, you don't really know why that person is there. And maybe it's because you're not having the right conversation with the team. Maybe like the team sees something and why that person is there that you cannot possibly fathom. It's like, no, they've worked really heavily on enterprise level things. And in order to be able to get from here to there, we need that person that's going to be able to shove us along the path. Sorry that you aren't following the bouncing ball, but that's why they're here. And this is also my note for if there's somebody on the team that you don't understand why they're there, it's probably because they're trying to get you from where you are now to somewhere else and you have no idea where that somewhere else is. Look for where that roadmap is. It's a good thing. But you, your design team. And then it gets really fun. <laughs> because you're going to have your designers, your developers, you're working on a project all together. I, I know how to be able to speak her language. We got this one. Like, we can tell stories. This is cool. But, like, this guy? Uh, uh, huh? What? 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 Where are we going with this? Oh, right. You want more flow in the shore. So you have to be able to figure out how to be able to have the conversation with both the designer and the developer. And they're going to be on wildly different viewpoints. And they're going to have wildly different needs about, but this is where our goal is. This is where it becomes more tricky. Because in all the other relationships, you know, starting from you, moving down, you sort of knew where, where things were moving, sort of. When you start getting into bigger and bigger things, you no longer know exactly what the goal is. You don't have that clear sort of, this is, you know, I mean, things, sure. OK, got it. I can give a particular, like, we're releasing a thing on this date. Um, we're finishing the sprint. The sprint is leading into other things. You can stack layers upon layers. From here, it gets more complicated. But you also have teams of developers that you'll be working with. Again, say that you're on bigger development shops. You're trying to make things happen. Your developers are going to speak differently. And more developers are going to speak differently than just one, or just one, with you know a designer. These relationships change. <clears throat> Knowing who you are in these particular conversations is also meaningful as well. I'm doing it on time. Ah. Let's say that you're the client. Let's say that you're on the other side. Let's say that you've moved away from actually being involved in the same sort of way. Um, you've got you and your project manager and your developers, and you're not the project manager in this point. You're the person on the other side trying to be able to have your manager and your coworkers being able to answer to this project. Um, and I think about this in terms of web development, being part of the uh, Drupal community. Um, I tend to think about this in terms of building websites and saying, this is what's going to be delivered here, and this is what people are going to be working with. So as a client, I am interested in being able to communicate back everything that my teams need in order to be able to make the website actually work and what my developers can build. Also, what I'm paying for, how that's going to work, what it's going to look like in the end, being able to communicate this to somebody that's outside of the team but is coming in and giving me advice around all of this. This is also the fun part. <laughs> so periodically, you're going to be on a team that you have no idea how you got there. You <laughs> No idea how you, why am I here? What has gone wrong? Where did my life go so wrong? What am I being punished for? <laughs> All of these things are going to be going through your mind as well. And this is a team that you didn't choose to be on. You're clearly on this team, and we might be aligned in some sort of way. So at this point, you have three choices, and it looks kind of like adapt, migrate, or die. 
going to have to adapt and be there and be like, all right, maybe I am that person back a couple slides. I was on the room tours and I was part of the design team. It was like, why are they here? What's going on? At that point, maybe you just adapt. Maybe you're the person that's meant to be able to bring them from point A to point B, even though it's just like dragging you all through the mud and there are people wrong on the internet. This is awful. <laughs> Right, there are people that are wrong on the internet and they're all over and I work with them, why? <laughs> or you migrate, you migrate to a, hey, you look like you are less wrong over here. I like less wrong, we can play with less wrong, okay. <laughs> I have hope, we have hope, we can do things. And then from there you can die. You can just roll out of the boat and be like, I'm finding a new place, this is not my team. Happiness does not lie down this route. So the teams that you didn't choose to be on. Also a really valuable learning experience for the things that you really don't want wanting to do. I can tell that this is, you know, we have all seen this story. This is a movie we all know. Conversely, <laughs> this is the guy that really does not want to be on the team. And I was thinking about, like, yeah, a team with James Bond would be the worst team ever. <laughs> God, he would just, like, run off and do, like, you know, like, no, 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 no. James, James, come back. James, James, stop with the martinis. No martinis. <laughs> James, <laughs> James, come on. Like, the Lord needs you over there. And he would be somewhere else. That's why you don't want to be on the team with James Bond. And sometimes you're going to be on a team with James Bond because James Bonds just sort of happen in your life. They just pop up here and there. And, you know, at that point you're like, okay, well, periodically I am that guy. Sometimes I am going to be the one that is going to be James Bond on the team and it is not going to go well for me or for anybody else. Knowing that, how do I work with James Bond when I am clearly in the same sort of space with him? How do I communicate my needs to him how do I listen to what it is that he's saying? Or how do I make him talk? One of the two. But yeah, James Bond was the one that I was thinking about. Like, you know, there's just always, there's always that one guy that just doesn't want to be there. How do we work with this? It gets more interesting. Because let's say that you're now, you know, <laughs> you are the client, you've, you've just started working with this client. And this is actually where more of my life is now in terms of doing new client onboarding and working with, how are we going to make sure that like, they really love us this much all the way through? How are they going to make sure that everyone is happy and like all of the right expectations were set and everyone knows why we're here? So, you know, big, happy, blue eyes, everyone is smiley, this is wonderful, if you've done everything right up until now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you haven't done everything right up until now, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Because <laughs> there's... Yeah, there's a client that wants to fire you. How do you react in this situation as well, where you know you can own everything that you've done, generally preferable. At the same time, understanding there might have been other things. Again, it's not just you. There were other people in this too. How do you work with the guys that are clearly coming up, super unhappy, kind of East Coast unhappy level, <laughs> little 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 bit of East Coast unhappy. How do you work? in this particular way that makes you feel satisfied at the end of the day. This is another relationship that will happen periodically. This one becomes fun. You're not on the level, you and the client that wants to fire someone else. The client wants to fire someone else. They don't really want to fire you, they just want to fire someone. They, they, just, <laughs> they, <laughs> they just want to fire someone, or maybe they want to fire your subcontractor, which is always challenging as well because, okay, this may be, in fact, some of your fault, but they're going to want a shoulder to cry on. They're going to be emotional, needy, all of these things. It's going to be very challenging to figure out, okay, who owns what? How are we interacting in this particular way? What got us to this stage? How do, how do we fix it? What is our team goals and how is this dynamic changing? Because they're clearly unhappy and they want to break up. Oh, okay. Um, now what? Conversely? You can be, yeah, the client that you want to fire. They, you know, they, they don't do what they say they're going to do. Um, uh, they keep using the word bubble up <laughs> when they're talking about content. Um, they, they, they can't possibly figure out ways to be able to actually hold design meetings without having you there. And yeah, I'm, I'm seeing like blinks across the room of like, oh yeah, yeah, been there. Maybe this means you're not expensive enough. Maybe, maybe this is what they mean. If you feel like you know, your, your time is being wasted because you want to fire them because, again, they're wasting your time, maybe you're not expensive enough. Maybe this is on you. Sometimes this is how this goes. 
Um, but, you know, I'm thinking about this from the open source consulting side, kind of moving my way through the stack of all the relationships that you can have in these particular ways. And sometimes you did just need to be able to get rid of them because they weren't supposed to be in the right place for you or you need to move on. How do you interact with them in a way that's going to be both generous but firm? Because, you know, you're unhappy. Goodbye. You can also have clients that really, really loves you, and this is great, and this is kind of like the, the follow-on trail from the, the one that was really happy before. They just started working with you, and they love everything that you're doing, and this never happens, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, well, I mean, because then from there, you can have the client that you really love. Like, you just love working with them as well, and everything is awesome, and this is great, but maybe you are actually too aligned with their mission. Maybe you are not going to be the person that's going to be able to tell them, you know, you really shouldn't do that. Like, that's a, that's a dumb idea. Like. If you love them too much, you won't be able to stand up and say, you actually, you're hurting your business if you do this thing. If you're too close to being able to see all of their mission and everything else around this, um, yeah, I'm seeing nods around. People have had these client relationships as well. And how do you interact with that? And how does that change the ways you interact with your other clients? Do you measure them all by this one? No, because it was clearly something about you that draw you into their particular circle. Also, it's pretty, you know. This is much more standard. <laughs> much more standard. <laughs> You're going to have times where it's going to be like, God, you, working with you guys is just like the best thing in the world. This is super fulfilling. I would do this even if you didn't pay me. And then they pay you and you're like, no, pay me more. <laughs> no, no, like maybe, maybe, maybe life is too short. Maybe, maybe this is not actually the way that we're going to do. How do you continually reset these relationships in a way that's going to make sense for you and for your long-term sustainable team? Um, Generally, it's going to be remembering there is, in fact, a reset button on all of these things and making sure that everybody can pay attention to exactly what we were there for and why the team was here. Yeah, yeah, mostly, like, you know, no, no one looks at me like, you know, you're crazy. But turns out you can't actually work with clients without, you know, potentially having something to offer them. So, again, you and your open source project, the Drupal project. Um, I've worked in Drupal since 2008, which is long enough to know better. Um, so initially when I first got involved, um, I kind of thought it was, you know, th th this CMS thing, it's okay. I mean, most people know what Drupal is, yes? Yes? Nods? Okay, cool. We don't have to go down the stack of like, this is what a content management system is and why it's better than the Streamweaver thing. But, you know, coming from the Dreamweaver world was like, oh, CMS, oh, you mean you mean we don't have to have this all like smashed all together in the same sort of database level? Uh, well, we have databases. Oh my God! Wow. Uh, so, Drupal initially for me was sort of like you know kind of a shitty CMS. Great community. This is awesome. So from there, the Drupal community has grown tremendously. Um, in 2008, um, 2009, we started getting kind of the big conferences. And our first conference that was big was like 1,500 people. Um, we just had a conference here last month in Portland, and that was a little over 3,000. So yeah, it's become a little, like there's a lot of movement around the project. There's a lot of people involved. Um, in previous talks, um, people have given the idea that we're, the community is about as big as Wikipedia, which means there are wild and vast aims all around that. And there's a different relationship as that changes and as it grows up, and as bigger and bigger projects come in, and again, as the communities change. So again, you and your open source project, that's a different relationship entirely. But you can't have a project without having developers. This is a slot, uh, shot from some of the Portland stuff. And all of these people are going to be working on the open source project in some way, shape, or form. They have certain things they want to be able to get out of it. Um, typically, a lot of people get involved because there was something that really irritated them about something in the project and they just had to fix it. It's a great motivator. At the same time, understanding why they're motivated by that also helps to see what's going to be able to be their particular focus. And we don't have just developers because, um, again, as James was talking about, we have the translators, we have the documentation folks, we have project managers, we have designers, we have everybody all coming in together and they have something different to be able to say around what it is that we're doing. Again, our goals are not as clear. They're, you know, we're doing things, but subsets of doing things and people are focused around different tribes. So a big tribal gathering. Also, other interesting note about this particular um, piece. 
see everybody in the kind of interesting teal colored, not the blue, the interesting teal colored. Those are all the people that I work with. Yes. So I am also part of Acquia. Um, we are one of the largest um, companies in the Drupal space. Dries is our CTO, so we kind of one of the places that feed and water Drupal in a meaningful way. And that's another interesting part about the way the dynamic works as well, because we had 140 people at DrupalCon. There's a lot of this kind of color out there. How do you interact with, okay, we've had all these experiences before. At the same time, the company works in different ways and is aligned in different ways than the community is aligned. Not all the time, but it's apparent in some ways, and that becomes challenging as well. How do you interact knowing who you are in those spaces as well? So happy to go into more story time about that. That's probably more of a longer boff or just, you know, a group therapy session. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, because it's a really unique position to be in, in terms of looking at all of these relationships that we have and what matters. But the core team is another part of this. We talked about tribes. This is one tribe of people that work very, very, very in depth on one small part because the core is what runs things and the core is where people go off on interesting things like, I don't like this database. I want to be able to scratch my own itch of being able to do another database. Like, I don't want MySQL anymore. Let's flip it out to like something else. These people have different needs. These people are looking at things that are very different from maybe the things that you're looking at. Um, maybe you don't really care about what database it's running on. I typically don't unless it's a problem. This is kind of how most people work. I don't typically care about things until they're a problem in my life. What are the problems? How are this, how is this group of people interacting in the ways that I want to interact with my project, with my clients, all of these things before? And you're always going to have one of these. <laughs> Remember how I was talking about like the team that you didn't choose to be on or the guy that didn't choose to be on the team? Well, there's going to be someone that's going to be on the team in your core project that is going to have different things about the way that things are going to be happening. Like he is going to be upset, he is going to be like deeply deeply cranky about all of the things that are going on. Sometimes you are that person. It means that he's seeing things that you're not seeing. He has different problems than you actually have and even though you're really, you're totally willing to roll over and play dead, He's not going to roll over and play dead because there's something that he knows that you don't. This is how I think about when at interacting with the, you know, the crankiest person on the team. It's like, there is something that he knows that I don't. What is it? Also very totally. <laughs> You're going to figure out exactly what it is. You're going to know. Uh, well, yes, and then at that point you're going to be like, sweetie, sweetie, I, I love you and this is awesome, but what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, I've, I've lost you about like four pages ago in your rant. Um, Describe to me how you would describe this to a client. And that'll typically bring it down like, you know, a couple levels, but not all the time. So this also is part of working in open source as well is because you're going to have somebody that's going to be working with you previously and he's really going to want something from you. And I give another talk about this, but this is more like community management in terms of there's going to be someone that's going to want something from your community or your project or your issue queue or something that you are not going to be able to give. This is just not going to be something that's available for you. And you're going to have to be able to say straight out, you know, we didn't really plan for that sort of thing. This is not your happy place. Please move along. Part of, secret part of community management is telling people to move along as well. Oh, that's so secret sometimes. But <laughs> your open source project is going to have a founder. And I have no idea why Dries was in a bat costume, <laughs> but this is awesome. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he's going to have different things that he's going to want to say than maybe you can see. He's going to have different things, or she, if you have, like, you know, other projects have other founders, turns out. It's not all one, but they're going to have different things. They're going to be looking towards different ideas. They're going to be moving different ways. And you're not always going to understand. And the relationship with how you make their lives better, again, in some ways, this person is kind of like a manager as well. You're going to want to make their lives easier, happier, better. If you make it more complicated, it's, come on, bad things for your project, you guys. Understanding how you work with them. And here's where it gets interesting, because your project is not the only project. There are other projects. 
again, there are many other projects and how we all work together in terms of did we have a goal? Yes, but what it looks like now is a little different because again, open source, it's all over. We have a lot of different things that are going on within the open source space. Um, I can't even name all of them. I was going to try and then I decided not to um, because there are too many. Yeah, and, and the, the same sort of ethos does not actually carry in the same sort of way. So how you interact with the open source community, how it works with what you were up to in the beginning. Again, all the way up there. We're now all the way down here. We've moved out in terms of like the consciousness that we were thinking about. It was easy when it was just you and your dog and your tools and like the stuff around you. And it was easy when there was one other person. And when there's a bunch of other people throughout the world, it becomes a lot harder. Because we don't all know what we're doing. But it is a lot easier if you know exactly who you were being. That's it. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Cool. That was exactly 30 minutes. I'm awesome. All right. Now that I've, I've been awesome, um, awesome questions? Story time? I see you, Greg. I see you making a face. Yes, this is an actual person. Yes, yes, and I actually cleared it with him before I did this. Um, so in, in our particular community, um, we, we have a gentleman who goes by Hayrocker. And Hayrocker is a dear friend of mine and has been for some time. And he's usually the one that just comes in and is like, you guys, like, you're doing it all wrong. Like, everything is wrong. Um, and he's recently finished a, um, a, a larger initiative because previously in Drupal, it has been really impossible to be able to have configuration be stored as part of your code. You do stuff in your website and you deploy over to another um, environment and none of your things would come along because they weren't in code. So we've just finished an initiative um, called the, the Configuration Management Initiative. So all of that configuration now goes into files and can be then deployed across environments. This is very, very, very cool. Um, this has been a problem for a really long time and it's been one of like the major pain points around just using Drupal in the first place. But we now have configuration management. Um, and these things also tend to burn people out. And uh, a conversation that I had with him a couple of weeks ago was, this was a dumb idea anyways, and I don't know why I did it. <laughs> I know exactly why he did it, but you, know, you, you go through cycles of burnout. And um, th this is also something that will make your cranky person be cranky, even if they're just burnout. You can't actually you know, parse for, um, nobody actually sits down and tells you, I am burned out. They are just going to be really cranky. Unless, I don't know, have you had the experience of somebody telling you that like, they are burned out? Yeah, but it usually shows up in other ways, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can yeah, <laughs> unless they're hiding it with something else. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> like, like, you seem out of sorts. Like, you know, uh, my coworkers totally could have told me yesterday, you seem out of sorts. And I would have told them, yes, in fact, I am. Let me describe to you my out of sortsness. All of it, I can show you all of it. Yes, Michael. That's a leading question, I can tell. Um, yeah, no, uh, a lot of the things about the uh, initiatives that are happening now in core are, again, we are expanding, we are growing. There are a lot of different things going on. In order to be able to sustain the kind of growth that we've done, we need to be able to make changes. And configuration management is one of those. Um, also being able to separate it out a lot of how that power structure is working in terms of like, so Dre's the only one that can like, you know, say things, but a lot of other people have opinions, turns out. Um, and being able to have those opinions, being able to take root and form and function also is part of what's going on in terms of the growth and how the community is working. So when I talk about the, uh, no, the open source community, it means that there's a lot of space for people that come in and have particular feelings around this is something that's working, this is something that's not working. Um, a lot of this also comes around to 
look, this project has been around for a long time. We have a lot of different things that we are working with. And the project has moved in different ways that couldn't have been predicted in the beginning. We were looking at, you know, God, 10, 10 years. Yeah, it's like 10 years, two years ago now. So it's at least 10 years old. And we have at least 10 years of being able to think about these relationships and how we've worked with both our core, our core team, our code, our community, and how that's all going to spin out into, you know, turns out people use Drupal. We have end users, my god. <laughs> I don't know if I've like, you know, answered most of that. How you move out into being part of an open source movement is what I think I heard. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was sort of just being in the right place at the right time in terms of, look, you know, we've got a lot of different things going on around social. Uh, that space is a little bit, you know, trickier to get into now. But it's getting the people that are going to be as passionate around you. Um, initially, when it starts, you want to be able to have the people that you're, it's like founding a company, really. Um, but it looks a little different on the other side. When you're not actually looking for money in the same sort of way, you're looking for a team of people to be able to get together. The Open Source Bridge Conference is a good example of this as well, because it um, turns out this is the fifth year. We've been able to keep this going for five years. And the first year that I was on the core team, um, it was focused around, OK, we have a lot of different roles to fill. How do we find the right person to do this? Also, again, the things that you are bad at, somebody else is going to be good at. Finding the person that's going to be at least as aligned with you on you're right, that would be a real cool thing to have happen. We can totally make that happen. I am much better at like raising money than you are. You go code, I'll raise money. Cool. So yeah, story time. Yes. Do you have any tips for um, kind of sensing how things are going? Part of the problem with open source is our communication channels are so low bandwidth. So if things go sideways, I usually don't know until after it's like way after. Like if you meet up in a space like this, then you get a much better sense of what's going on between you and, and other people. But if it's just over IRC or none, like, do you have any tips for um, kind of being better perspective for a better understanding of where everyone's at so that you can kind of make some corrections earlier? Yeah, one, ask. You know, step one is, hey, how are you all feeling in here? Two, I, I don't feel like I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Is everything cool? What are you upset about? Like, is there something that you haven't told me? What should I know? Like, I am not you. You are not me. Like, uh, what happened in here? Did, I, did we have a problem in here? Like, let's talk about these things. At the same time, being able to do regular meetups is also valuable as well, um, even outside of being able to say, look, we're having regular communication in the IRC. I feel like you can tell me most things. Um, and now there's these things like, you know, Hangout. And you can actually like open up like a, you know, a portal into, hey, knock, knock, everything okay in there? Like, if, if you're really upset, I want to be able to see your face. And I want to be able to talk with you around like exactly what's going on. Like, you were really invested in this and it didn't turn out in the way that you wanted to. Why? What happened? Like, you're, you're, I'm, I'm now seeing this repercussion coming through in certain ways. I don't know if I'm, you know, laying down some of the right ways for you. But look, I understand this is going to be an uncomfortable conversation. Let's have these conversations. Let's know who we're being in them in terms of like, OK, so I'm going to put my X hat on. Maybe it'll look like my sombrero of project management, um, which real, I still really need. But you know, being able to say, OK, we're going to have this conversation with these hats on. If we need to take them off and put on other hats, we can do that. But being able to at least have the structure around asking, knowing who you're being, and then being able to have regular communication around it is probably, that's, I mean, clear as I can put down tips in terms of that. Um, also, debriefs, regular debriefs, and debriefs with silly hats. So that's another talk. Oh, yeah. Um, also, relieving that person, being able to relieve that person, because if, if, if you're that person where everyone's like, ah, da, 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 it becomes very challenging because then you're like the secret keeper. 
because everyone has come to you with like the secrets. You're like, nobody, nobody, like, why, why, why do I have all the secrets? Like, couldn't he have some of the secrets? Like, like, couldn't, couldn't he have some of the secrets? But you're all telling me these secrets, and and then how do I channel those secrets in a way that, like, so you guys, this thing is making people really unhappy, and I know you didn't mean for this to be unhappy, but it's really unhappy, and here is the way that I'm seeing this play out, and here are the next steps that I think you can take. Knowing that that person is there, and then giving them the power to be able to say, "Dear Secret Keeper, what do you think would be the best, the, the next best move we could make?" That can be really hard if you're a small team or you're doing really, really well or small community. Because then the feedback is pretty obvious who said that. Oh yeah, I mean, but at the same time, like, then you get to own it. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you're right. I did say that, and here's why. <laughs> Uh, it, it becomes for more open feedback loops than maybe you wanted. So, you know. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being able to model that, okay, this is what this is going to look like. So when you have the conversation with Bob, do you need some words around how, like, you know, show me your words. <laughs> So you're on the spot, and you didn't have any time to be able to. It's like, so Bob, she's not actually like. <laughs> so Bob, I understand, and, and really, it's not about you, but it kind of is. And here's the thing, and yeah, no, um, it becomes very, that becomes very confronting at the same time. You're like, I just needed a place to complain. I didn't want to solve my problem just yet. <laughs> Like I. <laughs> exactly. See, problem solving at work. Great success. All right, we've got like a minute left. Story time. Oh, three. Okay. Well, I mean, we're going to lunch, so you're captive. But go ahead. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Or like, you really think that, oh, maybe later in hindsight I'll think, oh, I actually said it incorrectly. Or like, I, I feel that what I'm, I feel that my contribution to that, let's say, if you're going to criticize somebody, okay, I'm going to criticize you, but then you feel like it came out wrong. What do you do about that? Hey, I think this came out wrong. Let me clarify about what I meant. I might have misspoken. Um, again, you can be in a community where you've known everybody for a long time. Little secret. Nobody actually knows everyone. There's always a new place to be able to go into, and you're like, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Um, what I'm seeing is this, and I might be just totally crazy. Feel free to let me know in a gentle way if I am, in fact, crazy. But, um, you know, the gentle way is really the important part. But, like, you know, <laughs> like, again, in my experience, this is what I have seen. This seems off here. Can you talk to me more about that? It's asking people. <laughs> I, I don't Mm. That's on you. No, um, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, if you end up taking it personally, it's figuring out, like, okay, um, what, what's going on with me that's causing me to take this incredibly personally? What about this is causing me to go climb up in my tree? I have a forest of trees that I can go climb up. Which tree am I in, and why am I in that tree? And then you can start working, okay, all right, I am upset about this because this is reminding me of that other time, but now is not then different. I'm going to climb out of my tree and be like, okay, I was in my tree. I was in my tree, and here's why. And either, 
you know, here's the next step that I need to run that. Like, either don't say that to me again because that hurt me and that was awful. Um, don't, don't phrase things like that. And I did not like this. Again, using your words, but also communicating that, like, hmm, maybe there was something that I was missing here. I've acknowledged that I'm upset about this. Okay. Now, what can we do to be able to work through this? Is that what you meant? And if, if that did, if, if that's actually what you meant, then let's work about how I can feel less awful about this. It's, yeah, sorry, it's communication. <laughs> no, that was fine. Sweet. Well, thank you all. This is awesome. <laughs>